Okay, well, the, the good part of the discussion that we just had is that we already kind of covered a lot of the, the issues of impact because we know that students who are struggling internally with these anxiety issues are not really going to be mentally there to the extent that we want them to be. So they're going to have uh, impaired concentration and Ill inability in some circumstances to function at all. Um, for example, uh, a person with significant social anxiety who is unable to give a required presentation in class or in speech class is unable to give a required speech. Um, or read orally in front of the class or any of those kinds of things. We also know that kids with anxiety, we talked earlier about depressions, somatic complaints. Um, kids with anxiety also have a really escalated somatic complaints. So more headaches, um, more chest pain, more um, just muscle pain in general sometimes. And there tends to be a high rate of school avoidance. Um, among kids with anxiety disorders. And I do want to just really, I want to sneak another one in really quick. Um, because this is something that's not terribly common, but in the 10 years that I've been out here, I've had probably three or four referrals um, for a particular kind of anxiety disorder called selective mutism. Mm -hmm. Any of you have had contact with students with selective mutism? Fascinating, fascinating um, presentation. So we will have students who literally do not talk, period, in the school setting. The most extreme case I've ever seen um, a student had made it to freshman, sophomore year in high school without ever once speaking in school. Can you imagine that? Not speaking to a peer, not speaking to a teacher, not speaking at all in school. Um, but they can speak perfectly fine. They're very, you know, fluent verbally in other settings. And this is a variant of an anxiety disorder typically. Um, which is that there is something that triggers that anxiety. It's not exactly social anxiety. Um, but it's related, but, but the biggest presentation it results in is inability to speak in the school setting. What do you do? Those, the, you, a bunch of you raised your hands. What do you do with a student with selective mutism? Laura, what do you do with a student with selective mutism? You're supportive of them and you help try and find ways to make them comfortable in that setting and building those relationships. But we used a lot of uh, writing back and forth, mm -hmm. allowing for that piece. Uh, we had success with doing testing over calling home and having the testing done um, at home. Right. And letting like, mom do the oral reading testing and be able to get those probes. But really just being supportive and working with teachers on getting in her face and telling her she has to do this is not going to It's not going to. It's going to increase the anxiety and shut down the behavior even more. Um, on the other hand, when we can, we also want to be working towards um, greater functionality because eventually the student's going to leave our environment and many of these students are very bright. How's that going to fly in college? Where there isn't, doesn't tend to be the same level of support and accommodation always. Um, and so there is a really uh, pretty well empirically supported treatment for selective mutism which involves sort of graduated exposure and graduated building. So what, what, what you do essentially is um, you start small and you find ways that you can approximate verbal communication in a safe environment. So for example, you might start with, you take a hierarchy of, of uh, how anxiety provoking different situations are. So you might find out, for example, that the student feels comfortable talking over the phone as long as they're in a different room. So you might start there. You might start with having some conversations over the phone when they're at home and you're at school. And then you might work on that and you might work on some relaxation techniques and some anxiety reduction strategies. And then you might say, okay, well, how about, how about if you're parked in your car right outside the school and I'm in the school and we're talking on the phone? Well, I don't know, that's, a, that's an anxiety level of like 70, I don't know. And this is maybe taking place in writing, right? Um, but but you, you find something that's maybe about a 40 anxiety level, zero to 100, and you do that, and you do that for a while, and you reduce anxiety. And then um, the goal is, within the school environment, to find a confederate, to find someone that the student feels comfortable speaking around or to. And you might need to build that up, too. You might need to build that up slowly, so eventually you have one person that they feel comfortable talking to because you've built it gradually over the phone. And then how about this? Okay, so now you're in the same building. So you're in the school and I'm in the school, but we're in different rooms and we're talking on the phone. So you can't see me and I can't see you. 
kind of anxiety provoking, but you do it, you get it built up. Okay, so now we're gonna get, we're gonna talk on the phone. You're gonna be in that room. I'm gonna be right outside the door. Door's gonna be cracked open, but we're talking on the phone. And so you see how incrementally you have to build this up. And you get to the point where the, the, the child can talk to that confederate, be it a staff member, be it a peer. Um, one really interesting case, it ended up just purely by accident being my daughter, <laughs> who was about three at the time. I was working with a student in a school who had selective mutism, and I went to the school on a completely different issue and took some materials to drop off in the library or something, and I had my daughter with me because it was my day off. We happened to run into this student when it was just the student and me and Ivy, who was super cute at the time, three years old and just adorable, curly hair everywhere, big eyes. She talks to this student, asks her a question, and the student, like you can see her like, but she could not bring herself not to respond <laughs> to my three-year-old daughter. There was nobody else around, so she talked to Ivy. And once the Ivy became the Confederate, purely accidentally, so then I had to go through all this ethical process. Of, like, can I, can I bring her? To, like, can I engage her as a Confederate? So we went through all this stuff, and that's what we ended up doing, is we would bring her to the classroom at times. And this girl felt comfortable talking to her, and she would talk to her around peers, and other peers would hear her talk. And then, I mean, it was a slow process, but it's, it's a fascinating thing anyway. See how I get on tangents? You're supposed to be preventing this sort of thing. <laughs> Questions about selective mutism. <laughs> okay. Is there any research on uh, whether it's more males than females? Um, I'm not aware of any. And actually, three out of the four cases that I've worked with uh, in the last 10 years have been female. Um, what there is some research about is that it's more common in certain ethnic groups than others. So three out of the four have also been Hispanic. And that's in keeping with the research. But I don't know, I don't know that we know exactly why that's the case. Any, any other questions?